Isaac, go ahead with what your question was. So my question was, during the Tower, the tower of Babel, do you think it might have been possible that animals spoke the same language as humans, and they all got scattered into the different languages that they are now? Well, I will say, I don't know if it was the Tower of Babel, necessarily. Though I can see the reasoning why, because they would have been able to communicate quite effectively with the animals and each other and synchronize a whole lot of systems and get things flowing. But whether or not they were they were able or unable to communicate with animals during the Babel incident, at some point we did communicate with animals. And at some point, that capacity was lost. I think Tower of Babel would be an interesting case study to kind of look at and to consider, okay, when we say confuse their language, what are we actually meaning? Because it could have spent, it could have done a whole lot to our interaction with animals if, in fact, we were communicating with animals beforehand and the Lord's confusion was that comprehensive. Consider the fact in Genesis, let's go to Genesis 3. Uh, don't have to have your Bible open, I'll just go there in your minds. Okay, we are... Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent... He said to the woman, and the woman said to the serpent. Which implies, whether or not you believe this is a manifestation of the enemy, whether or not you believe it was used by the enemy, it was, it, it was a, an animal that was used by him, or a literal representation of the clowns, they did communicate. Matter of fact, it says, he said to Adam, Adam's primary job was to name the animals, which meant he would have ended up communicating with the animals to a certain degree. Which means he would have known what each animal's design was and purpose was, which means even the snakes had a purpose and the skunks had a purpose and their ivory built woodpeckers had a purpose and the passenger pigeons had a purpose of delivering messages to and fro. Whether it was like Dr. Doolittle or whatever the case, you know, Rex Harrison or the new one, Robert Downey Jr. or Hugh Lofting's books or whatever the case, there was definitely that capacity for Adam the Mercy to speak to the animals. Now, the other dynamic is that given that the land animals were created on the sixth day, which was the ruler's day, there would have been some capacity of them to engage in being used for systems. If you think, before we had tractors and modern farm equipment, what did we use to plow? Animals. Animals. System. Um, before we had... Uh, before we had flight, and before we had automobiles, what did we use? Carts and buggies. Carts and buggies pulled by? Horses. Very good. Um, I'm of the opinion that horses as a group were all ruler by redemptive gift. And that splits out the breeds by there. The Arabian Stein being prophet, the Tennessee Walker being exhorter, secretariat being a Tennessee Walker, if I remember my breed correctly, was exhorter of exhorters. So breed exhorter plus horse exhorter. So that layering dynamic. Now, these capacity for the animals on the sixth day to flow in this ruler dynamic of being used in systems, the land animals specifically, um, I think there's that capacity. And I think Babel would be an interesting passage to look at. So when we're talking about the confusion of language, what do we mean by that? Is it just human language or is it all communication got sideways? <clears throat> because the Lord said, uh, yeah, you guys are doing too much. You guys are not doing, focused on the right vision. It said specifically that in the my translation, 
that they were one people with one language, but I was wondering if they could be the animals who may be considered as part of that <gasps> one people. Um, I think the reason the, the scripture points out people is because people were the focus in this case. The animals would have just been a tool along the way. But I think it's possible that the communication barriers got erected in response to man's following a nasty, negative vision that is not the vision the Lord had for them, which is what happens frequently when you're engaged in <clears throat> doing something that is less or other than what the Lord wants you to do. Continue eating your food, Amass. You're perfectly fine. Um, I think it is good for us to ponder those things and to think about them. Um, but that's a really, really good question. Thank you. Um, Matthew... It certainly does give a 14. different twist to the possibility of Noah and the Ark. Yes. It would have been a little easier for him to manage animals for a year on an enclosed boat without them freaking out if he could communicate with them. Correct. Yes. And then you have the far side cartoon where you have a dead zebra and Noah says, okay, from now on all carnivores will be combined to sea deck. Good old Gary Larson was good for a laugh. <clears throat> yeah, but it would have actually helped Noah had he been able to communicate, which is likely what happened. Again, Noah, mercy. Now, I'm not saying that mercies are adept at this, but we have a couple of situations in which you have mercies that were able to communicate. So, without further ado, Matthew 14. Okay. So we are here, and we already said that Jesus, verse 16, you give them something to eat. Now, now that we've covered that in depth, and the passage, the passage where Jesus was actually testing the disciples. Uh, oh, that's weird. Very good. We go to here in verse 17. They said to him, We have only five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over, and all those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. So, the next issue here was, in John 6, 6, it says, he said this to test them because he knew what he was going to do himself. So, he asked, well, what do you have? Newsflash. Dealing with the previous verses like we dealt with yesterday. He checks to see what our resources are. He points us back to our resources. And then he takes what we bring to the table, he partners with it, and he multiplies it. He partners with what we have, and he multiplies it. It's not that he, oh, we have this thing called faith, and we just walk in faith, and Jesus waves a magic wand. No. He takes what we have and he partners with it. It's very important for us to get to this point. Because we have been conditioned in the charismatic movement by the five-fold ministry <clears throat> to believe that we need to have a welfare mentality and a poverty mentality, and we need to let the grand poobah, the apostle, the prophet, who has the resources, hear God for us, and we need to stop hearing God for ourselves. That's by and large what we've been taught by the fivefold ministry. 
that is what this nonsense has created for us, this welfare mentality where you go to the anointed man or woman and they have the resources and you do not. And so we've been conditioned to wait for God to wave the magic wand and fix our problem when really what he's going to do, he's going to fix the problem using what we already have in hand. Now, are there times when he does a creative miracle? Yes. But, largely, he is waiting for us to walk as sons, to take an assessment of our materials and our resources, and partner with us using those materials and doing something supernatural. Our job is to take the principles that we already have, bring those to the table, connect with him, and get his game plan. So often we don't want to get his game plan, we just want him to wave the magic wand. Do you have anything to add, my dear? You know, like the dis in this passage, the disciples didn't know. And he handed them a, a piece of a resource that asked what's on hand, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, look, five loaves and three fishes or two loaves and three fishes or whatever. Um, how, I don't recall exactly what the... Two what fishes, is. five loaves. And, you know, you know, so obviously we're not talking about industrial-sized loaves. It's a small boy's lunch. We're talking about something the size of his fist, probably, as far as, you know, maybe an anchovy or a herring. Uh, you know, whatever small fish. We're not talking, you know, 500-pound tuna or something. Um it was some, some kind of a small fish and some small pieces of bread. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the Lord didn't give them words. The, the Lord just said, well, you feed them, mm -hmm. right? Have them sit in groups of 50 or whatever. Um, and and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the multiplication didn't happen. Um, and then they, so, so, so the Lord didn't make a pile of food appear. And then they pulled from the pile to pass yes. out. Yes. That's it. That's not what happened. The Lord gave thanks to Father, broke the bread, and handed it to each one to start passing out. And they probably thought he was out of his mind. You can think about this practically, okay? Here's a group of 50. I want you to feed them. I've given you a half a roll and a piece of fish. Okay? Seriously. And, and the disciples are probably like... What? But they didn't question him, or if they did, it's not recorded. They just, I think they, I think they actually was like they, I, they either had a little bit of faith. Probably this is where that mustard seed concept came from. Well, I've seen him do some really, you know, powerful things, but I've not seen me do powerful things. See, it wasn't Jesus passing out. It wasn't Jesus making a pile. It was Jesus giving thanks, breaking, and handing to the disciples, who then had to have that little muster seed of faith, that little bit of faith to say, okay, I'm not going to freak out because you guarantee they were freaking out. I'm going to do what he says and see what happens, okay? But they were the ones going and interacting with the people. So here's Jesus way over here. This is... We'll say Peter, way down here at the first group of 50, going, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? I can't feed 50 people with a half a piece of bread and a half a fish. But he just started breaking, following the example, not complaining. And that's pretty something for Peter because his mouth was always leading him into trouble and passing out to people. Okay? And as he broke and passed, that's when the creative miracle happened. But they had to take the action without seeing. And that's a really critical piece of this passage for me. It wasn't, it wasn't God making a pile and then they come, went back and said, oh, cool, I got this pile. I, they didn't know where it was going to come from. They didn't know what was going to happen. They did not have a pile of food to pass out to these people. Mm -hmm. They had a little bit of food and Jesus going, here, pass it out. So think about you often will go, this is impossible. Well, they were there. Yet, they took the resource in their hand, they believed God, they believed Jesus, and they said, okay, well, I'm going to look like a complete jerk, possibly, but this is what I have for this group of 50. And it kept happening. 
and and it kept happening but it wasn't because of anything they could see or and it wasn't because of anything they could believe because mm -hmm. it's not like Jesus said this is what's going to happen just trust me he didn't say that he just said go feed people he didn't clue them in hey I'm going to do a miracle here I mean, just, I mean, think, take these stories and instead, because we all know how they end. And we know, you know, they collect 12 ba baskets of leftovers. So they collected more leftovers than they had to start with. Okay. We, we know how it ends. But take the time when you're reading scripture to think, you know, what if I were sitting there? And I saw a disciple approach me with a half of boy's fish and a, ha a half of boy's piece of bread and a half of boy's fish for the 50 people I'm sitting with going, I'm going to be hungry for the rest of my life, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> Right? Think about what it felt like for the people sitting there. They were hungry. He'd been teaching for three days, or he'd been teaching for quite a quite while. while. Quite a while. And, and and it was getting to be dark. And, um, you know, and it's hot in that climate. Um, and when you get hot in an ocean climate, you get hungry. Mm. So, they were hungry. They did not want a morsel. <laughs> And then the, the disciples were in the same boat. Jesus said, go feed them. I have no resource. They legit had no resource. Yet, they didn't mouth back. They didn't br break down. They didn't flip out. They just went and did it. And the creative miracle happened because they acted on it. So, it's good to read your Bible stories from not knowing the end and thinking about what would it have been like in that moment. What if I were Peter or James or John? It's worth the time to do that. First yeah. Corinthians nine twenty seven says, "But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise." For to confound them. There's other translations, and another rendering of the account. I can't remember if it was Mark or Luke said or John said, but what are these among so many? Mm. Sure. God is trying to bring us up out of a current mindset that is focused on the limits. And he is trying to draw our attention to the limitless potential it is in God when we take the principles and we apply them. We take what Father has given us in here, in the book, and in all of life, and to apply all of that to bear on a problem in a situation. So if you're willing to unpack it, though, because they just want the Lord to wave a magic wand. That's not how Jesus operates. He operates by shoving you out of a place of faith into a place where you're walking in something and doing something and using something that he has given you. So these are things to ponder as you are in the process of engaging with him. If you can create or conceive of the end without using God, you're not walking faith. Without depending on Him, you're not walking in faith. He has some impossible things for you to do, and He wants you to bring your resources to the table and partner them with His infinites. So, just some thoughts there. We bless y'all to enjoy your day and to take the resources that Father has given you and partner with his infinites. Be blessed, guys, and we love you. Bye-bye.